Rangers fans, welcome to Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I'm Andrew Chelney, alongside Nick Zararis. And Nick, game 82 of the Rangers season is tonight. They can clinch the division, the conference, and the President's Trophy with a win tonight against the Ottawa Senators. I personally, now, sorry if this is a scorching hot take, think they should win this game instead of the alternative. The Rangers should find whatever's wrong with Connor Mackey and fix it so he can play and they can beat the Senators again. <laughs> I know Connor Mackey's been hurt, and that's why he hasn't been around. That's why Scanlon was the extra defenseman at the beginning of the month when they were missing got when they were down a couple guys. But yeah, Connor Mackey saved the season at the end of Fe- at the beginning of at the end of January going into early February, where they were really in that lull. Um Sam and Joe were talking about it on the broadcast during the game. I want to say during the week, I want to say it was Wednesday or Thursday night, whenever they had played during the week, that the Rangers in that middle stretch of the season, they they weren't great. You know, they played about 500 hockey. They came out of the gate scorching hot. They've been scorching hot for about a month and a half now. But that middle period was a little dark. It was a little gray. You know, that we knew reinforcements were coming. We didn't know what the what shape they would be in. But they endured that rough stretch where they played about 500 hockey. That's a testament to how good they've been this season, that 500 hockey was the roughest portion of the season. And now they're at a point where it's simple. You beat one bad Ottawa team that has nothing to play for. You lock up an easy first-round matchup, which we'll discuss. It's looking like it'll be either Washington or Detroit. Those are a lot easier than the Islanders. We'll talk about the game on Saturday, which very fun regular season game. Definitely had a playoff feel to it, but... As far as today, it's straightforward, man. This is the third game with Ottawa. They've split the previous two. Take care of business. Make your playoff path as easy as possible. That's that's the that should be the message in the locker room is yeah I mean obviously in any situation you'd want to win the game than lose it but in this particular situation you can make the path so much easier for yourself just by winning this one game. Sure, you know. You can make the argument, you know, no, not you never take teams for granted and, and things like that in the playoffs, but it's objective that teams like Detroit or Washington would be an easier first round matchup than than somebody like the Islanders that are that have played the Rangers really well forever. Like that that's been the that's been the the matchup for, for those two teams. So why would you essentially make the first round uh, a, a slog it probably a six or seven game matchup against a team that you know is a bitter rival. You're gonna be the Islanders are gonna be throwing big hits on big hits, and that's gonna cause you know guys to be banged up or injuries and stuff like that. Obviously, it's a playoff, so every team's gonna do that. But the Islanders, of course, have an edge to that because it's Islanders Rangers. So why would you then, you know, why would you make why would you force that matchup when you could play a team like Washington or Detroit that? clearly isn't as good you know that are making their making the playoffs based off vibes alone that are just trying to do everything they can to possibly make it and even then you know that's not confirmed yet because hey if they lose their next two and philadelphia wins well you're playing philadelphia a team that's also running on fumes or i mean if the penguins win two i guess you could play the penguins which i would rather not have that happen please and thank you the Penguins, if they lose tonight, they're done. They yeah. they are mathematically yeah. eliminated if yes. they lose tonight. They really kind of – I don't want to say you shit the bed because the Bruins are a good team. You know, Pittsburgh is very shorthanded. They're not that good. And that was kind of the death knell for their season Saturday night. Like you said, anything's possible math-wise. But I think – there's a real argument that the reason the Rangers looked so terrible against the Flyers on Thursday is that they were looking ahead to Saturday. That sure. Saturday was really the kind of swing game where they, the Rangers were in the pole position for first overall in the whole league, President's Trophy. You know, Going into last week, looking at them playing the Flyers, the Islanders, and then the Senators, those are three games where the Rangers were favored in all three. You know, The Islanders have played the Rangers well historically, but it's pretty clear that they came out flat on Thursday night. They were kind of looking ahead to the Saturday game and the Saturday game was a good, a good reminder of the Rangers strengths and a good reminder of their weaknesses for large stretches of that game. 
the Islanders did a great job of clogging the middle of the ice and forcing the Rangers to play the perimeter, to cycle the puck, and to settle for bad scoring chances. You know, it, it's not often you're going to see Adam Pellick getting a breakaway going the other way, yeah. but that's going to happen when the Islanders are so rigid in their structure and they're more than happy to block your shots and go back the other way. The Rangers were able to overcome that situation you know they didn't play great you know Panarin good lord he scored the goal to force overtime to redeem himself but there were two or three turnovers Uh, where he was doing too much you know that's exactly Mm -hmm. what went wrong for him in that series against the Devils last year was he was trying to do too much he wasn't incorporating his teammates he wasn't using his individual skills he was forcing pucks to the middle the Islanders had plenty of chances in that game both of the goaltenders were great you know the Rangers got two posts one in the shootout and then one in the overtime Barzell uh, Shesterkin made the great save on Barzell in overtime that was a really good game but it's also a reminder of the Rangers limitations when they are forced to cycle when they are forced to play physically and live on the perimeter and work for their offense that's the recipe to slowing down the Rangers they don't want to do that they want up and down, east-west, they want the game to be open-ended and lots of scoring chances, at least this season. The Islanders don't want that. The Islanders want to bring this game down to a slog, rely on their defense, their forechecking, and make you work for their offense. That's not to say the Rangers can't overcome it. They did. They won the game. They had to go to the skills contest to do it. (laughs) But yeah, it's a reminder of the Rangers' limitations. Not to say they're not good, but when they play a well-structured team – it's harder for them to find offense. That's one of the the fears going into the playoffs is can the Rangers, I don't want to say overcome that because that's kind of been their, like this has been their style of play. So they, they I, I would have to imagine at this point of the season, they know what they're good at. They know what they're not so good at and what they work on in practice and things like that. The, the fear is, okay, you match up early on in the playoffs against a team that really you know, makes your weaknesses shine brighter and you're not able to create offense in a way that you are either accustomed to or want to. And that creates a, a essentially a who can get to one first type of race. And that could be an issue for the Rangers because the teams like the Islanders, as we've seen, I mean, like you said, like you mentioned, Adam, pa- Adam Pellick never had a shootout opportunity before, never had a penalty shot. Like this man is not known for his for his his speed or his hands or his, like it, that's not what he's known for. And yet he had, he had uh, you know the first his first penalty shot of his career. Teams like the Islanders are good at forcing the Rangers to into their uncomfortable areas of expertise. They do a good job of making sure, hey, you know, Panarin's not just skating circles around everybody. You know, with these nine cross size passes every 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 shift he's on. The Islanders force the Rangers into uncomfortable situations. So the the issue becomes if you face them round one or a or a similar team that plays like them round one, you are making the Rangers start off on an uneasy foot. The whole part of the the draw of the playoffs, as we've seen with teams like the LA Kings that made it on the last day of the regular season, I'm pretty sure a few years ago when they won the cup, is a few years ago, Andrew, that's like a decade ago. A decade you can't ago say a few point. years ago, a, a about decade 10 ago. years ago. Yeah, a decade ago at this point, whatever. Is they got off to a, a really, sh- you know, all, all, all team zine is one, right? Because the, 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 I think this was the year that the, uh, this was 2012, I'm pretty sure, when the, the Sharks were up 3 nothing in the series. The Kings looked dead and out, if I, if I remember correctly. And then the Kings just won one game, and then they just cruise all the way to the cup. Like, there's so much of the playoffs that is momentum and you can argue okay momentum does it is it real is it, is it made up like what you can argue that's a cosmic moment like whatever but that but so much of that is one game at a time one play at a time and if the islanders sense blood of or you know any other team hey the rangers are uncomfortable if we can force them to continue to be uncomfortable and maximize on our opportunities, we have something here. For the Rangers, what, I mean, uh, avoid that, please, and thank you, but also getting off on the right foot does so much for your confidence and so much for, okay, not only did we do this the entire season successfully, now we're doing it in the playoffs and we're rolling. We can continue to do this because we're really good at it. 
path of least re- path of least resistance. It's not that the Rangers can't play that way. Sure. They've done a reasonable job. You know, they have they've won three of the four games against the Islanders in the regular season. I believe they won the season series with the Flyers, another team that plays that similar style. It's not that they can't. It's that there are other teams that are more favorable matchups. You know, sure, it would lead to. Be- Bad habits would develop if they just played Detroit for seven games because Detroit doesn't play defense. They just track meet it up and down. There's cherry picking. There's no defense being played. And that might cause issues further down the line in later playoff series. But you worry about that when you get there. As far as matchups, you want Washington or you want Detroit. Those are two teams that are just two or three guys. In the case of Washington, you know, it's really just Ovechkin and Charlie Lindgren. If you want to throw John Carlson in there, sure. But Tom Wilson's been dinged up all season. TJ Oshie has been dinged up all season. That's not a particularly deep team. That's the kind of team where the Rangers over the course of a several game series are going to be able to wear them away just by playing their game. The the Capitals are not that talented of a team. Did it with Detroit. The big... My biggest my biggest concern is just simply a matter of not knowing who you're playing. I know it's not like football where the X's and O's really matter of knowing who you're playing. It's going to give you an advantage. But the Rangers, there's a real chance they don't know who they're going to play until Wednesday or Thursday of this week. I'm yeah. sure they've already done all of their necessary pre-scout. They have stuff on all of these teams considering they play them in the regular season. But as far as approaching the mindset, that's the thing about the playoffs that's different. You know, you don't play the same team seven times in 14 days in the regular season. It's a very different mindset. And it speaks to what you were talking about, this idea of momentum and this idea of small samples. It doesn't take a lot to go right. And a lot of the time, it's a coin flip, some of these series. You know, I have I have brought up the fact that the Panthers won three games in overtime in that first round series against the Bruins last year. Pretty much every single time we've talked about the Rangers, the President's Trophy, first overall. The Panthers were a good team last year, but they got hot at the right time. And as that series wore on, they started to believe. That's not to say, you know, the Bruins couldn't have put them away. You know, all it takes is one overtime goal, and we have a vastly different conversation. The Bobrovsky save on Marshand. Yeah. What what was it, Game 7, like late third period, I'm pretty sure it was. It was right at the end of the game. Marshand could have won it in regulation, and that was – like we, we could be talking about a wholly different Stanley Cup playoffs last year. Yeah. But Bobrovsky made the big save. The Panthers scored the big goal, and they moved on, and they crushed the Bruins' dreams. Like it, all it takes is one bounce. Yeah, and when you're playing a team like the Islanders, like Detroit, like Washington, like the Flyers, we can even put Pittsburgh in here. Those types of teams, the longer you let them hang around in the series, the more they start to believe. You know, and I'll I'll tie this perfectly back to the Rangers. The Rangers were dead in the water in Game 5 in 2022 against Pittsburgh. They had no life. I believe the score was 2-0. Truba hits Crosby. They rally back. Okay, three games to two. You still got to win two straight, but we're not dead. Then you win Game 6. Anything can happen in a Game 7. That's really what it gets down to. And it would be nice if was we knew... Was Game the 5 the Louis Domingue? Uh, goal from from the blue line that he gave up, or was that game six? I think that was game six, but I could be wrong. I would have to look that up. It would be nice if we knew who the Rangers were playing, because then we could go a little bit deeper, because right now this is just kind of philosophical and like big picture stuff, which isn't the most enthralling, but something I did want to touch on. We still feel like the Rangers can play better. I think that's the biggest reason why I feel so confident about this team in relation to pretty much any Rangers team other than 14-15. Like even 13-14, I didn't think that Rangers team was great on paper. I thought to get to the conference finals would have been a successful season. 14-15, that team I genuinely felt had the capability of going all the way. This year, this group, they have played reasonably well you know what was the stat the other day they hadn't scored a five on five goal in like 10 days something like that before the game against the islanders so you know there there are holes in this team's game they haven't acclimated jack roslovic great he Mm -hmm. hasn't fit but he's not killing them yeah you look at the lineup and you would like a little bit more consistently from zabinijad and Kreider, but zabinijad had a decent game against the islanders he was noticeable made an impact panarin lafreniere trocek plenty plenty has been said already 
poor Panarin in a normal year, he'd probably be top three in the heart, but he's probably not even going to get top five in mm. all honesty because of who's ahead of him. That third line, they don't score, but you can't get the puck away from them. That 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 is which is important. I, that's the ideal possession third line and the fourth line. We don't know what it's going to look like yet, frankly. I know Laviolette today, this morning, said Rempe will probably play in the playoffs at some point, that he's prepared for it. But I don't know if he's going to be an every game kind of thing or if he'll come in as like a momentum swing type. But on paper, this team is decent to good, has played great, and has the capability of being excellent. That's the thing I that sticks with me, that we have been nagging about the five-on-five play, the third defensive pair, and they're probably going to win the President's Trophy. All they got to do is beat a bad Ottawa team. And they've been this good. And they still have room to get better. They haven't really clicked yet. You know, you watch the game against the Islanders, that game against the Flyers. You watch the games last week. It hasn't been cl- crisp. It hasn't been the cleanest. And they found the ways. If they can get that momentum going and really get into a nice rhythm, then this team can be genuinely scary. We talked about this last week where people will – you know, we'll, we'll we'll point out a flaw in this team, and people will yell, "Oh, well, they have—they're the best team in the league." How? What do you mean? Why are you complaining? It's 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 the equivalent of you know we should improve society somewhat. Oh, but you participate in society. Curious. It's like this is the same. This is the exact same thing. Is they are the best team in the league. They have the most amount of wins. They have the most amount of points. But it's not like they're eighty-one and zero. It's not like they're and and uh, like that's silly. Obviously, you know, no teams are going to be anyone to know. But like, you know, they they've lost games. They've looked not great in stretches. They have issues offensively, defensively. That yes, while they are the best team in the league, that doesn't mean they're a flawless roster that plays flawlessly every single minute of every single game. You know, nitpicking to a certain extent is is you know. It, it's a little rich when it comes to really minute things, but these are issues that we've been talking about for multiple years now. It's not even a, a, a last like eight days. Yeah, they haven't scored a five on five goal. They scored one by Panarin, you know, against the Islanders. But for the most that this past week has been a, a like a, a barren wasteland of five on five goals. That was that that was a minuscule problem this past week, but it's also been an overarching issue the past three, four, five years for this team. So it's not like, you know, highlighting that aspect is is a negative because this is something that they've been having issues with for a long time. So for this team, really, it comes down to can they not just rely on special teams? And I understand, you know, you're going to get power play opportunities. Like you need to convert on them, et cetera, et cetera. But most of the game is at five on five. If you are if you are getting shut out at five on five, like the Rangers have been for the most part of of this past week in the playoffs, that is going to be a big problem, and that's one of the worries that, that we both have with this team. That hopefully they don't run into come game one. Yeah, that's not to say there's plenty to be said about their style at five on five. The and this was. The argument, this was the foundational argument as to why changing the coach probably wouldn't raise the ceiling of the group that much in the summer. That it was ultimately going to be on the guys who were here to tweak what they were doing, how they did it to get to that next level. And at times, this group has played at a pretty high level. They, and I know that sounds silly to say about a team that's probably going to win the President's Trophy, that they've sometimes played at a really high level. But when you can tell the difference when you're watching, you know, when guys are where they need to be, when the rush opportunities come, when they are able to sustain pressure for extended periods of time, you know, you saw a glimmer of it on the power play. That one power play they had late in the game against the Islanders, where they were in the offensive zone the entire two minutes, and Sorokin was standing on his head. The Rangers generated four or five really good looks, and the Islanders didn't touch the puck once in two minutes. That is, that's the type of level you need your power play humming at come playoff time and one last thing on this subject of why the ceiling is high before we switch gears 
Since February 1st, Shesterkin, 16-5-1, 2.3 goals against, 9-2-6 save, 14.65 goals saved above expected. The goal saved above expected is third in the entire league. And then for his career in the postseason, the wins and losses, 13-14, and 14, that doesn't really matter to me, but 2-4-5 goals against average, 9-2-9 save, and then 23.2 goals saved above expected. Over the last two years, he's got the most goals saved above expected of anybody in the playoffs. Um, this is the best goalie in the world. I feel reasonably confident in saying he has an argument to be the best goalie in the world. He's the best goalie in the Eastern Conference. And even if you're looking across at Florida, I, I'm taking him. If you're looking at Tampa, I'm taking him over this stage of Vasilevsky. Yeah. With him as the foundation, they have a very high floor. He dragged them to seven games against the Devils last year as best he could as best as he damn could, and it wasn't his fault. And I know come the playoffs, the casual hockey fan starts to look for the scapegoat, the, well, why is my team down in the series? And they see the goalie, you know, giving up three, four goals a game. You're playing better teams. The other team is going to be more inclined. It's going to be easier for the other team to score because they're more talented. Believe me, you will know if it's the goalie's fault. It's more likely than not going to be not be Igor's fault if this team has issues. He's been really solid down the stretch. There have been a few games here and there where he stunk it up, but it's a long season. You know, you're going to have starts where you don't have it. You feel good about the goaltending. You feel good about the power play. It still feels like, and I, I don't think this is a controversial opinion, it still feels like the biggest swing is the defense. If the defense yeah. is playing to its ability, I feel reasonably confident. If it's the same old night to night, you don't know what you're going to get. Then, you know, your sphincter starts to tighten a little bit more. That's uh, that that's been the problem with that. We've been highlighting for again for years now, the the two big question marks heading into g every single game and every single playoffs has been, will the five on five offense show up? And what is the defense going to do today? There's no it. It seems like the defensive consistency is is lacking to say the least because like sometimes they'll sometimes they'll play really well like adam fox against the islanders had an awesome game he he broke up i want to say two or three maybe surefire goals had the pass gone through or had the shot gone through he was excellent but then you go through the rest of the lineup and you go okay well if truba and miller remain a pair that's going to be just lunch for the other team to feast on come playoff time they got broken up, thankfully. Will Laviolette go back to them because they have experience together? And if you are listening and not watching, I have the biggest air quotes on the screen right now. It, it, just because you have experience doesn't mean that you're good at it. Like, just because you've done it before doesn't mean you passed. Like, you know, it, go back go back to your, you know, your school days. Eat it. Just, like, if you fail the test... That doesn't. You can't go to your parents and be like, "Oh, but I got experience with the with the with what was on the test." So next time, I'll do better at it. It's like that's not what that means. So not all experience is good experience. That has shown to not work. So please, if if Jake, if Truba and Miller can not be a pair moving forward, that would be great. All if the Rangers get consistency from the blue line and at five on five, it doesn't. Like, ideally, you know, you score at five on five every shift and you score 10 goals and like that's that's all hunky dory. But ideally, you just want some level of five on five consistency offensively and then the power play can carry you over the top and then, you know, Bob's your uncle. But those are the two things the ra uh, we've been saying this every week on the show pretty much those are the two things that the rangers have to show shore up if they want a chance at the stanley cup so i think the big issue i don't think the rangers have the optimal skill sets on their back end to make three pairs that really complement each other i think that's part of why they've defaulted back to this a few weeks ago I think it might have been Dom. It could have been someone else at The Athletic wrote something about it. And one of the stats was Schneider and Miller was effectively the same as, as Miller and Truba. The results were not great. They got out chance. The other team scored more. And I think the issue at hand is 
that that pair gets the hardest matchups. They play the other team's best players. They're typically not deployed with the Panarin and Trocek Lafreniere line, so they don't have the benefit of forwards helping tilt the ice for them. And there is no good solution to this problem. I think that's really the hardest part of this situation to wrap your head around. Because sure, would you want to give Fox harder matchups? Yes. And that might help your team's defensive results. But if you do that, you're probably taking him away from Zabinijad Kreider and Roslovic or Panarin, Trocek and Lafreniere. And then you're losing your ability to tilt the ice offensively. So I think you're, I think the mental calculus there and why we haven't seen Miller and Fox and Lindgren and Truba is that they feel they would rather have Fox and Lindgren on the ice with their offensive guys to try and score because it's more important that those guys are able to score than it is Truba and Miller to prevent the other team from scoring. Because ultimately, this is what we talk about a lot. You can't win a hockey game 0-0, and it's why we don't critique Lafreniere, Panarin, and Trocek for playing no defense. Because even though they don't play any defense, they still outscore the other team. They don't have to because yeah. they provide so much offense. That's kind of that's why that's my theory as to why they're not going away from what they have because they need Fox to tilt the ice. They need the goals at five on five, especially. And that's why they're not going to go away from that. Because if you go away from what you have right now and you disperse your guys a little bit more, I don't think they would feel as comfortable about their chances of creating offense. Could it happen? Sure. I, I still think Fox Miller can work. I think Linger and Truba can work. I think Schneider Gustafson is fine as a third pair. I don't know if I would feel as comfortable with Schneider Gustafson or Schneider Jones or any combination of those three as the second pair with Truba Lindgren as the third pair. I don't know if I would feel okay about that. I feel bad for Zach Jones. He's played pretty well when he's been asked to post deadline. He's just not getting in over any of these guys. It's unfortunate. I would argue he's played better than pretty much everybody other than Fox and Miller for decent stretches of the season. But he just doesn't have the seniority to pull weight effectively because he deserves to play. He's yeah. been one of their six best defensemen this season. No, I a hundred percent agree. I, I think you should play over Gus. I think they have similar, similar, similar skill sets. There you go. There's, I, I know, I know the English language. They have similar skill sets, but Jones one, I feel like is more dynamic offensively and also not as bad of a defensive liability as Gustafson. Whereas with Gustafson, like he would have one or two games where he plays really well. And then he has a stretch of three or four where he just looks like he has never touched the ice before. It's a very strange dynamic with him. And that I think is, is a large part of why teams date Eric Gustafson, but they don't marry Eric Gustafson. Because... I think Gus is fine for what he is, but I don't. He's not a guy you commit to. Yeah, I think he's very solid. He's in. He won't kill you. He can help you, but in the you... right in the right circumstances. Of course, of course. Yeah, he's a solid player. He's definitely the best of the six D the Rangers have had in a long time. Oh yeah, like yeah, genuinely, yeah. like the last six defensemen. I felt as good about as Eric Gustafson was like Kevin Klein. And that was like seven years ago at this point. Yeah. So it's been a while. I'll it's, take, I'll take Gus over Jared Tenorti any day of the week. Thank you. I still can't believe that Tenorti, Adam McQuaid, they, they forced so many guys into that spot purely based yeah. on. He I'm did. just, I'm just happy. Yeah. At no, this, I, at this stage of, at this stage of, of our Rangers fandom, I, for one, I'm happy that I don't have to, be sweating bullets that Libor Hayek is going to see playoff time. That that to me is is my number one is is where and, I draw the most happiness from. And this nicely segues into the main topic I wanted to broach today. I think there's a real argument that this that this time period from 2005 to the present. I think there's a real argument this is the golden era of the Rangers franchise. I think that there's a real argument that they've re-elevated themselves to one of the league's preeminent teams. They missed the playoffs three years in there, and that's it. You know, you make yeah. the play and two of those years you were consciously not trying to make the playoffs you were genuinely a bad team i didn't include the bubble playoffs because that wasn't a normal playoff so sure. if you wanted to they made the playoffs 14 times in 19 years they won 13 playoff series in that 19 year span and that includes a lot of one and dones that they still managed to win 13 series the only other time period of rangers hockey that's remotely comparable and we're not doing original six don't tell me we're not doing original six era i, I hate to sound like mike francesa but we're not doing 
do an original six. That's not real. That's not the real NHL. I, I cannot put as much weight on playoff series wins when you only needed to win two playoff series to win the Stanley Cup. Yep. From 1977 to 1994, they made the playoffs 15 times. They won 16 playoff series. They made two cup finals. They won the cup once. If the Rangers win the cup this year, I think there's a real argument. This is the best period in the history of the franchise because the league has never been better. The league has more teams. It is harder to go on deep playoff runs more so than ever because the importance of the regular season has decreased because this playoff format is set up not to reward good teams it is set up to induce chaos yeah and also the level of of skill has yeah. increased exponentially now again and we say that not to talk negatively about the eras before but we're simply highlighting how incredibly skilled every player in the NHL is right now the goalies are the most flexible and dynamic and, you know, like all these things that the league has ever seen. Even you, you go back even 10, 20 years ago, goalies were not as athletic or as movable as they are now. Movable? Is that even like, I don't even like they're, they're, they're very athletic and they like. They're agile. They're incredibly agile. And yeah, the, the, the level of, of skill that they have is so much higher than the league has seen ever before. The competition is so is so much is so different. Every athlete has, you know, has nine different nutritionists on hand and they're they have 18 different skills coaches and all these things and to optimize every percentage point that they can when they actually go out there and play. This is the best the league has ever been. This is the best the league has we've ever seen, and the fact that this team is right now sitting at the best spot in the NHL, despite all of that going on, is a testament to how well they have one played and two built this team to this point. And real quick, speaking of the Rangers being built well, the most surprising news that I have that I, you could you gave me a thousand guesses as to who was on the ice for for practice this week and I would not be able to tell you that Philip Hedel is back and also cleared to play now will he actually play uh, that is a question for Peter Laviolette he they the doctors have fully cleared him and he is practicing he was in the locker room uh after the Islanders game when they were getting at the Broadway hat he was he was in the background so he's you know he's around the team I would think that he plays, which is what, like, that is insane. Insane for me to say that after what he's been through this season, after the setback, after the statement that they put out, that they are shutting him down for the entire season. And hopefully he's back next season. We didn't know if he ever play again. And this dude's practicing. This is insane. So uh, I am going to throw a little bit of cold water on that and say some of this is purely just for vibes. It's good Could to have be. him around the team. It is good for him to be around the team. And whether or not he plays, I don't – I am not baking him into my calculus for the team. I yeah, think that sure. should be your 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 MO for the playoffs. If he plays, great. Don't expect him to play. You know, the Rangers candidly would tell you they kind of didn't handle it the best the first time around. And now I think everybody's kind of in an agreement and has a better understanding that, hey, let's take our time with this. Let's make sure everything is squared away. And if we feel comfortable with him playing and he physically feels capable of playing, that's a conversation to have when the time comes. He needs practice. He needs game shape. He needs to be in shape. It's hard to get up to speed when you haven't practiced. Even if you're practicing by yourself, that's different from practicing with the team, which is different from playing in a game. I hope he plays. I hope they're able to incorporate him and force a guy further down in their lineup and deep in their lineup and give them another useful, dynamic player who's capable, who has made some big plays in playoff games. It would be awesome if Filipino was capable of playing. But I do think this is partly a vibes thing as opposed to genuinely that he's going to play. Not that he can't, but I just think that based on everything that's happened, I, I would be very surprised if he played game one. There's oh yeah, of time he's not, I don't think he's then. gonna play game one. Yeah. I I definitely do think later down, like let's say, 
I I don't think they ram him into the line into the lineup early on in the playoffs if they don't have to. I think they're going to give him as much time as as he, as as they physically can. But let's say, for example, that it's Game Four of Round Two, and the let's say the Rangers are down two to one in the series. They I think that is the point. Well, they're they're going to have a conversation with Hedl and say, okay, can you do this? Are like, are you comfortable playing? You you know you've been practicing for a while. You're you're sort of up to speed with the you know with back into game shape kind of. Can you play? And I think that is when we see him. I don't think we see him in the first round, unless things go terribly wrong for this team, which I you know hope please please don't. That would that would not be very cash money of you at New York Rangers. Please don't do that. But. I think that is when they have that conversation. I think they're going to try to delay that as much as possible because they want to be as careful with the situation as they possibly can be. But if they are at a pivotal moment of a a playoff series, that is when they're going to revisit and have that conversation with them. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, The last topic on today's show, and this is going to be difficult to do because we're comparing errors. I genuinely think the only Rangers team you can make an argument for being more talented than this specific iteration this year is 93-94. And that's a team that had five Hockey Hall of Famers. And if Mike Richter stays healthy, probably six Hockey Hall of Famers. This group we're talking about this year, I feel like the only lock at this point is Adam Fox. I don't know if Panarin will have the counting stats. He may get the benefit of the doubt for his international play, for his play prior to coming over. But this is a really talented group, man. I, Henrik Lundqvist never played with a team this good. I, I feel very confident in saying he never. the only player he played with that was as good as Panarin's playing right now or Adam Fox is playing right now was the one season of Yager where he set the franchise points record. Other than that, Lundqvist never played with a team this good. Um, this is easily the best Rangers team of my lifetime. Uh, I, I'm 27. I was not alive for 1994. This team's better than 13-14. It's better than 14-15. It's better than any of those Yager teams. It's better than, uh, of course, it's better than the Vigneault 2017 team. It's better than the last two years. I don't know. I will say, how I contextualize this team will ultimately be determined by how they do in the postseason because this is the do or die season for them. But it's hard not to have an appreciation for how this season has played out, in spite, especially considering the energy coming into the season. A lot of people, us included, expected them to take a step back from where they were last year, expected them to come out of the gate slow, to kind of linger around the playoffs, and wouldn't have been surprised if they were a fringe team. And everybody kind of – I shouldn't say everybody. Panarin, Lafreniere, and Trotrek dragged them through large stretches of this season – you got in, you got contributions from guys you weren't really expecting, like Gustafson, like Will Cooley, like Johnny Brodzinski, like Matt Jimmy Rempe. Vizzi's having a great Jimmy Vizzi's well. having a really solid counting stat season as well. When you get career years from top six guys like Panarin, Trocheck, Lafreniere, and all your bottom six guys perform above what you expect, you're going to have a good season that's where the excitement comes in because all it takes is one or two more guys getting to where they need to be. And they're right there with Dallas. They're right there with Colorado. They're right there with Vegas. They're right there with Vancouver. They're right there with Florida. Hell, they're right there with them right now. Yep. If they can get Zabinijad for two weeks to play like one of the 20 best players in the world, it's a scary team, a genuinely scary team. And he has the capabilities of doing it, which is exactly one of the things that we, you know, always mention on the show is sometimes he chooses not to use the skills at his disposal, which to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if you're if you have the ability to do it, why don't you just, you know, do it more often, Mika, please. You know, I'm I'm asking you nicely. But it it's one of those things where the ceiling on this team is the Stanley Cup. They have every piece of skill that is necessary for them to win it all they have the elite goaltending they have the elite offense and they have the elite special teams as well not just the power play the penalty kill has been awesome all year round it the the both ends of special teams have been great all all year long the the high end blue line talent is there with adam fox and kendra miller and guys like that 
it's now just a matter of can the highs outshine the lows that we've seen from this team? That's all they need to do. I mean, easier said than done, obviously, for the next two months. But that is the most crucial part of this next of this stretch run here is at the end of the day, can your best players and the best parts about your roster outshine the other team's best parts for two weeks? Okay, you did that against Detroit and Phil, you know Washington or whoever it is. Okay, now you got to do it again against a better team. Okay, now you got to do it against an even better team. Okay, now you're at the Stanley Cup Final, and now you are playing the best of the best of the other conference. If you do that against the best of the best, congratulations. All right, you said their their ceiling is a Stanley Cup. What's the floor? It has to be second round. Has to be. Like if because a first round loss to a team like Washington or a team like you know Philadelphia, Detroit, even the Islanders would be an unmitigated disaster. It would be it would be a collapse, and nothing you know nothing less than that. It would just be absolute worst case scenario break gla- break glass in case of emergency. Like that's what that would be, because after everything that happened last season and all you know and and how they played all of this year. The vibes have been great. The play has been great. Everything has been, you know, great to this point. And this is a, a big year for contracts and how the core shapes out and all these things. You take a look at, you know, ahead of time of, okay, well, eventually things are going, like, is because if the core breaks down again, round one, oh, you're going to have a lot of questions about the core moving forward anything any like anything before the second round is is going to be a disaster fire this the absolute floor is the second round but even then that would be a disappointment because of how well they've played and what the expectations for this team are but the second round has to be the the absolute bare minimum floor if they get bounced in the first round there's going to be hell to pay i completely agree with you and in my mind I know it's going to be unreasonable to say the expectation is to win the Stanley Cup. I think it is reasonable to say the expectation is they need to make at least the conference final. Yeah, I don't think that's unreasonable. I agree. Based on the matchups they are going to get where Detroit, Philly, Washington, or Pittsburgh in round one, assuming they win tonight and they get first place, and then round two, the winner of Islanders, Carolina. The Rangers have played both of those teams well this season. The games against Carolina have been... Um, stressful to say the least, but uh, Carolina does not scare me. The Rangers have historically played Carolina well, except when David Quinn was the coach, part of the reason why that clown should never be coaching in this league again. (laughs) But I digress. Carolina does not worry me. You get to that conference final and you're playing Boston, Florida, Toronto, Tampa Bay. I can live with that. You have a tough series loss against one of those teams in the conference final. I can live with that but you need to get there. This is the easiest path the Rangers will probably have. I don't think the Rangers have ever had an easier path to go on a long run than this year. Maybe you could say 2017 where they played Montreal in round one, Ottawa in round two, and then if they had won, it would have been Pittsburgh in round three. That's the only one that's comparable in terms of ease, but they also didn't win in round two that year. So God willing, they take care of business tonight. They win win the president's trophy, which ultimately doesn't really matter. I'll read the stat I had told you before, but of the eight teams that have won both the president's trophy and the Stanley cup in the same season, six of those teams that won the president's trophy, seven points or less. So if the Rangers win the president's trophy, they would fall within that criteria. Depends how things finish behind them. The Bruins could finish at most one point. The stars could finish one point win tonight take care of business, go into the playoffs. You got a nice four-day layoff here going into the weekend. We're hearing the Rangers are probably going to start the postseason on Sunday. Sunday. Mm -hmm. So you get a nice five days. You probably get a real off day, probably two of those days, and then you ramp up, start practicing, and game one in the jungle Sunday afternoon. Sounds like the Knicks are going to to host game one on Saturday, which – by all accounts, unless they, the, the NHL is going to make a, the game one a matinee for the Rangers, which I very much doubt. It, if By all accounts, it will be Sunday the 21st for game one against insert team name here in four or five days. We'll find out. This is it. 
this now now we're here. All all eighty one gonna be eighty two games now uh, after tonight. In the past, soon now begins the real season. Now you know all the cliches of the champ, you know, championship starting. You know you can you can insert whatever kind of miracle uh, thing that you want here. But at the end of the day, this is as we talked about one of, if not the best teams we've ever watched in this era. We could watch all the 94 highlights and clips that we want. We Both of us were not born in 94, so we weren't there to witness it live. That's not our fault. Sorry to tell you, like, you know, for the, the 68-year-old that's going to be in our mentions of like, oh, well, back in my day, you have it, you, you know, you didn't watch them. It's like, yeah, that's not our fault. That's just kind of how life goes. So we weren't there live in 94 when they won. I would like to see one live this time around. Please and thank you, Rangers. Uh, I, I beg of you. We will talk to you guys at some point before the puck drops for game one. What day that'll be, we'll figure that out once we know for sure when they're playing, who they're playing, what time of day they are playing. That'll just about do it for this week's episode of the Liberty Blue Podcast. Make sure you are subscribed. Wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you are watching over on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, like the video. Tell us who you think the Rangers are going to play in round one and what your expectations are for this playoff run. 